So, it's funny how some things work out. Um, I, as you may have known, had some positive interactions, including a uh, very decent Twitter space with somebody called Tyrant Regicide, uh, Tropical Regicide. Um, and these things resulted in a Twitter group message. Um, and that group message resulted in some other things. So, um, basically, this Unity Spaces group message on Twitter was designed to coordinate Twitter spaces with people who were interested in anarchist unity. Note that. Um, and those people who are interested in anarchist unity were supposed to use that space to enable efforts toward unity. Um, and the general vibe uh, of the room was generally pretty good. Uh, people started getting added of a variety of anarchist sorts, and in general, um, things were like pretty copacetic, um, at least I thought, because he not only, uh, like, got added to that, but he also, uh, got added to a Discord server, and because he posted about one of the spaces he was going to have in that Discord server, um, yeah, things got a little bit dicey, because that, uh, that Discord server is full of a bunch of, like, leftists, leftist anarchists, um, and also right anarchists, and that's an anarchist unity server. So it got their hackles up a little bit when, uh, the person that he was going to do a Twitter space with was, um, a MAGA person. And after an admittedly kind of I don't know. It could have been handled better. Um, it, like, sort of interrogation about uh, the nature of the person with whom he was going to stream. Um, after that, um, he basically uh, had this stream after leaving that server. This Twitter spaces. And he was like, I'm not going to deal with this. He left, right? And fine, okay, whatever. But, like, I thought we were still on reasonable, maybe, terms. Yet, when I joined the space and was told um, that, like, um, he was looking for more than just, in fact, this person to stream with, to do a Twitter space with, um, and was offering the mic to anyone who would take it, I was like, sure, might as well try, because there were some things that were being said. Um, and generally speaking, um, I, I pressed the speaker button, request to join, and apparently because of Elon Musk, you know, I'm willing to be good faith here for just a moment and say, because of Elon Musk, uh, the request didn't go through. But at the same time, uh, it also seemed as though uh, I was uh, being intentionally kept out. Because the person I was told uh, was one of the brains behind this particular Twitter space, uh, Tyrant Regicide, Tropical Regicide, had blocked me, thus kicking me out of the Unity Spaces GC. And so I thought that this was concerted. I thought that they were both on the same page. Fuck Jeremiah, that mentality. I don't actually think that's unreasonable. And I thought that they were just not accepting my speaker request. So I, uh, I posted some tweets in response to some things that they were saying. Some of which he took very personally, despite those things having been posted uh, before I even knew about the space happening. Uh, but we cleared that up. And didn't get any feedback except being told that I'm a drama queen, starting things, and no, I didn't censor you, you never had your hand up, despite me actually doing that a shit ton. This is just more evidence at the best faith interpretation possible that Twitter Spaces is a terrible platform for discussion. Uh, so it reifies quite a few things in my mind. Um, but 
With that being said, eventually they did address it and uh, said that they that they like were offering me speaker. And at a certain point, a little pop up came up that says that I can join as a speaker. So I clicked that and we had an awkward sort of intro uh, to the Twitter spaces. So I'm going to include mostly the things that I was involved in in this uh, spaces. Uh, additionally, there was input from Kareem Mays. Uh, I'll link the Twitter spaces uh, like in full so you can listen to all of it. But primarily, I focused on the stuff that uh, that affected me and what I was saying. And it'll be like a synopsis kind of territory. Um, and uh, like this particular stream ended with uh, this person saying that uh, that we should have a debate on or a conversation or whatever on whether or not anarchists should work with MAGA folks and he um, yeah he d he's he's doing a bad job of convincing me because I specifically hate AI and he said he asked Grok this conservative like purposed AI uh, to tell him what MAGA people wanted and um, said that it was allegedly close enough to anarchists that we shouldn't be complaining. So, fun! Um, but anyway, the point is that I think that it was relatively fruitful once we actually got into the meat of it, and I'm going to share that here, the meat that I was involved in. And I'll also include a link in the description to the full stream, and y'all can decide for yourself how I did. But there's this stuff, and there's a bunch of other stuff with which I disagreed um, that I will be at some point uh, probably responding to in one way or the other. But, like, not the least of which is near the end, they started to bemoan that conservatives don't, like, take stronger action against trans people. So that's always fun. Um... Anyway, the point is that, um, yeah, I had some issues. I had some issues with the presentation, with the things being discussed. I uh, stuck my quills in it because I'm a hedgehog and I always do. And uh, here's that. And I'll also be breaking in the middle to sort of tell you when the discussion split. Because there was this giant 30-minute thing where I basically said nothing. And uh, if you all want to hear me say nothing, you can go to the stream. So, with that in mind, um, the, uh, the stream in full can be found in the description, and, uh, yeah, here is my appearance on this conservative Twitter space. Uh, en enjoy, or don't? And I gave you speaker when you came in. I'm not censoring you, you know, what, whatever, but I know, I know you wanted to make a point on this, so... I'm going out of my way, even though you didn't raise your hand, to make sure you get the speaker, Jeremiah. Well, the first thing is I did raise my hand multiple times, but um, I don't know. Maybe it uh, didn't have the option to actually raise the hand because I wasn't a speaker yet. I don't know. Spaces has issues sometimes. But uh, <clears throat> generally, the reason I talked about censorship is because I was um, removed from a group message uh, allegedly about unity by somebody who blocked me over this. So anyway, the thing that I was blocked over was my accurate statements talking about an FBI DHS report that came out from uh, the Trump administration. It was findings that were released in May 2021, and the findings were basically uh, that the Trump administration had for years surveilled a significant amount of people, um, not the least of which were people involved in uh, like militias, anarchists, and a variety of other people. Um, and in general, I think it's valuable to bring this up because a lot of the time when issues come up, um, like censorship issues especially, uh, conservatives have a tendency, and a false one, to assume that it's just hitting them or that it's primarily hitting them. And in this particular case, what happened was the Strategic Intelligence Assessment for 2017 says that in 2017, DVEs, that's domestic violent extremists, remained a persistent source of violence with racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists advocating for the superiority of the white race and anti-government or anti-authority violent extremists, agaves, 
ironically, that's funny, primarily anarchist violent extremists, militia violent extremists, and sovereign citizen violent extremists, presenting the greatest threats of violence. So, basically, he listed a bunch of people who would normally be considered um, in the, like, anti-Trump camp, alongside a bunch of people who would be normally considered in the Trump camp. Lots of militia members, lots of people who, like, advocate for gun rights, and a lot of other stuff. So the reason I'm bringing all this up is because it's valuable to remember that the state has long uh, spied on a variety of people, most notably spied on leftist groups and uh, anarchists also, and used uh, the powers that they gain from like go going against terrorism or communism or what have you as an excuse, as a pretext to surveil other people. And it's only when the other people start to be surveilled that they start to take notice, which is fine, you know? I, I encourage people to oppose this sort of surveillance and censorship state. Uh, wherever possible. But at the same time, like, you gotta know that, you know, if you start to oppose it before it gets this bad, you would have a lot more allies on your side. Also, uh, I went against the idea that we're not doing shit in Africa while the U.S. is actively making deals with Somalia to build five new bases in their country. And when AFRICOM is some of the most persistent, uh, like, U.S. military presence in the Middle East and Africa area, and they have, like, the longest-running conflict that, uh, that, like, surpassed Afghanistan recently because, like, Afghanistan is obviously pseudo-over. Um, but they're still in Somalia. Black Hawk Down basically signaled the start mm -hmm. in 93 of what would eventually, like, go on till now and still pass now. And the Biden administration is actively helping Somalia uh, work with that. They're actively helping Libya, which is also in Africa, unify their government so that they can point them at Sudan, which is also in Africa. There's plenty of places in Africa that the U.S. is indeed doing shit in. And finally, the Israeli thing where, like, suddenly, you know... The, the the Palestinian thing is like a new issue. There have been people who've been pushing for the like freedom of the Palestinian people for a long time, and this is just their latest thing, where they're just like at the latest moment, like starting to come out in larger numbers because of the massive amount of casualties and death. Thirty thousand deaths and seventy thousand wounded. That's a hundred thousand plus casualties, and that was a month ago. Which means that that's why this push is happening. It's not some centralized push. It's a push because people are dying and being hurt and being treated like second class citizens to the earth. So let me jump in real quick. And uh, first, I want to say uh, hello to Autumn and Lizard Jesus. I think I said hi to Kendrick already. Request a mic if you want one. Um, Jeremiah, well thought out, well, uh, well supported and well said as always. You're an articulate, smart guy. Um, you did catch me on one thing that I, I misspoke when I meant we're not doing shit in Africa. What I meant was like a boots on the ground operation that was approved by Congress. I, I, I know we are I, I, probably on both sides of every conflict that's existed for 50 years, uh, including, you know, arming the Taliban and all of that. So, no, I, I 100 percent get that. And I, I, I know we're in that. I'm just saying what I was saying is, you know, when we say we're going to liberate people because of freedom or oppression or you know things like that we never say that about like africa we only say that about places that have oil or you know they said it about libya congress will get behind they said it about libya they said that when they went and liberated those people from gaddafi by shoving a knife up his ass because he tried to have a pan-african gold currency right that, yeah i, I guess i kind of limp uh, uh lump them in kind of more in the middle east but yeah i mean that's libya for sure um, I, so I, Jeremiah, I was using them as a as a symbol, uh, symbolic example of we're not trying to liberate anyone. If, sure, if you like just they're lying. That's the only point I'm trying to make. They're lying. They're not trying to liberate anybody. That's that's all I was trying to say. Sure, sure. You were right. going to try to liberate people. There's a you know a dozen places in Africa that they have worse conditions than probably anywhere else in the world. And uh, oh, and I wanted to address your your Palestine point. Um, I mean that that's a hundred percent correct. I, I agree with that totally. 
I think that they're just very well organized because, you know, uh, it's been, like you said, it's been going on for years and years. And, you know, it, it's been a very strong voice on social media and, you know, on college campuses and places like that for many, many years. Like you said, it's just, I think they just, that this was just a very, you know, uh, uh, easy uh, point to rally and get louder and, and all of that. And, you know, I think that people realize that there's actually three sides of this argument. There's the pro-Palestine argument, there's the pro-Israel argument, and then there's the people that realize that the United States has tinkered in this so much, we don't know who to believe. And, you know, that's the camp I'm in. You know, I mean, you know, Israel does some weird shit, Palestine does some weird shit, and, you know, and and we're like, you know, uh, you know, we're, we're, you know, our CIA does, you know, absolutely mind boggling stuff on a regular basis. At the no behest of Israel. All the time. I, I, that would be my, uh, that would be my assumption and the stuff I've seen. Yeah. Let me go to Casey real quick here. He's had his hand up for a little bit. That was awesome, Jeremiah. Thank you for all of that. So Jeremiah, I have a question for you. Like you mentioned Africa. Um, I'm curious, I, do you know how many uh, people from China in Russia are in Africa and taking over the land there? Oh, uh, yeah. So um, I oppose uh, foreign entanglements, whether it comes from BRICS or NATO. And the fact that I have to sort of oppose BRICS in order to also oppose NATO um, is sort of like the whataboutism that distracts from actual issues. Uh, I do oppose BRICS, absolutely, yes. Okay, but so what what percent of the continent is taken over by China in Africa? You don't know that either. Neither of us do. But would you say it's 50 percent or would you say it's greater, less? No, it's probably much less. And usually in certain territories that are contractually obligated by certain corporations that have taken loans, in addition to certain governments that have also taken loans. But many of those governments have also taken loans from the IMF and other Western sort of loan agencies and or dollarized. So the Western influence there could also be said in some of these same places to overlap in terms of taking the place over. So in terms of total takeover, probably much less than you're implying. Okay. And when we're talking about China being in Africa, why do you know why they're there? What so, is their whole intent of being in Africa? Uh, similar reasons to why the U.S. is there, to employ soft power and eventually maybe hard power in order to uh, ex- exhibit influence over the local resource and shipping route acquisition territories. What do you mean by local resources? I mean uh, lithium, gemstones, oils, metals like gold and silver and platinum, things that they can use for raw materials, most notably chips and the chips arms race that's going on right now. It's part of the reason the U.S. is starting to intervene so significantly in Latin America, because they can get away with lots of resource extraction if they can put it under the banner of getting those people freedom. That's the reason they're building vassal states like the one in Argentina with the Western puppet Javier Malay. Correct. And and that's what I was trying to make sure that we're getting to here is because I see the conflict is different. Like you, the way you implied it, 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 and when I was asking the question, it was also targeting in that same way, is it is a physical confrontation, right? Um, but no, it's not. When it comes to the land in Africa, where everybody is going there, and a lot of people don't realize this, every country is extracting them for every all of the every ounce of gold every ounce of silver, every ounce of every rare material that exists on this planet, we are extracting it from Africa and leaving them poor. Yes. And every country is doing that. Yes. And people keep saying Africa, and that's what I wanted to clarify. You're the first person to actually elaborate and go into the detail that I would expect, which is, hey, we're not there for conflict or global position in the world. We're actually there to try to get our own piece of it. Yeah, they're, they're carving it up. You have They've Russia, you have China, and you have America doing tearing apart Africa to get all of the raw materials out of them, and then we're just going to leave it. 
That's yeah. what all of these and, countries are going to do. And the, see, I do disagree, though, in the position aspect, because, like, if you extort the resources of a country for long enough and expropriate them to the level that has been done to African nations, like, if you do that for a long enough period of time, what you'll get oftentimes is uh, th that the countries with the leftover resources will have all of the power. It's sort of, you know, in the, uh, like, in, 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 a, in, a, in a kingdom of dickless men, the man with one dick is king. And it's sort of like, if you've got all the resources because everybody else doesn't anymore, because you were part of that expropriation, yeah. that is asserting your position. And the further that those countries slip into dependence on your systems, the less they can retaliate against brutality that has taken place against their countries by Western and or uh, Eastern influence, whether it be NATO or Brits. Sure. Yeah, I <clears throat> I get what you're saying. I. I, I don't think that you can have much position on the United States being in Africa. Um, I, I just think the other countries, and this is all of an opinion, there's really no nothing else other than just my opinion with it, is the, the other countries are going in just to take all of their resources. And the and United States looked at it and was like, wait a minute, why are you doing that? We need it on that. And so that we're doing the same thing. Ah, the U.S. has um, been doing the same thing since the slave trade. Like, they, they've always been there for the resources, like, and so has everybody else. We, Africa's a giant gold mine for a whole lot of resources and pretty much always has been. Yeah, but China has much more of a presence um, maybe, than we do. Maybe China's gaining some presence, but the U.S. has more mega corporate presence in the in the Middle East and Africa combined, and also has uh, direct influence over the IMF and World Bank, uh, both aligned with Western interests if, and uh, NATO specifically. And uh, those those organizations have been responsible for the vast majority of aid and loans, specifically to the African continent and countries within it. So I wouldn't say that China has directly like the most influence they're certainly edging up on territory though yeah in, in africa i'm i'm not talking i'm not bringing in the middle east when sure. you bring in the middle east it, it yes in american is in africa no one dominates too. the middle east more than the united states in like africa the united states too. just owns it like if you look up imf loans to the to, to africa and also which countries like um are are getting on a cbdc that uh that that cash sure. money that we talked about earlier um those countries have Venn diagram that is a circle. Basically, if you want in on the new monetary paradigm, you've got to get in line with the loans and the aid. And uh, aid is how they get you. It's how they've been running soft power regimes for like since the 50s. Like earlier, if you count like the aid to the like, you know, Ukrainian Nazis in the late 40s, earlier even still, if you count the aid to the uh, Israeli migration to Palestine to begin with and the Nakba and the Six Day War. Like, w when we're talking about aid, like aid in the, the, the territories in question, pretty much you'll you'll catch Western influence at the top of the list, and China's only starting to threaten that, which is why they're being considered such a threat that the media's talking about them as though they control most of it when they don't. Okay. Yeah, see, and I, I get what you're saying. Uh, when it comes to actually, like, I'm looking at it from a landmass standpoint, because how do you dam dominate in a king-queen type of regime or an old-school war is it's landmass, right? Mm -hmm. And if you were to do landmass in Africa, I, I'm trying to pull it up on my computer right now, and I, have, I can't find it very easily. But I want to say that the United States is at, like, 35% versus China's well into 40s. Um, I mean, and, I guess that's theoretically possible, but I would definitely want some facts behind it, especially since the IMF works directly with the U.S. and could be considered a part of them through the hege hegemony. Like, that's that's one of the things that should be considered in any sort of fo foreign policy discussion is hegemony and, like, sort of soft empire and the sort of alliances that create fusions of countries that aren't officially the same country but act as like one unit as a block sure. that's the reason everybody's concerned about BRICS. um it's also the reason some people are concerned about nato and uh like it's the same reason that brexit happened like when you're united with other countries through formal and informal alliances and like sort of treaties and things that you can do in order to get that sort of position as an allied nation um you'll act as a block, and I sort of don't consider it different 
um, and, like for the U.S. and its hegemonic allies to be lumped together than for when, for instance, you started this off by lumping together Russia and China as part of the thing. Yeah. Because it's like, it's true. Like Russia and China are part of a strategic alliance. It's called BRICS. And it's Correct. getting more members by the moment because lots of people are trying to resist the Western hegemony. And like, I don't like them either. But like at the same time, when we consider like outsized influence, uh, the Western influence has been outsized for a significant period of time. If it really is that close, like even if you're right about China superseding the U.S. in total influence, uh, if it really is that close where it's somewhere in the mid 30s in terms of the U.S. and somewhere in the early 40s in terms of China, um, like that's exact proof of what I'm talking about, because China's just now edging in on that market. The fact that they might have some outsized influence at this point is only them edging the U.S. out of the, their pre-existing outsized influence, usually through institutions like AFRICOM and allied sort of military and intelligence industrial powers. Sure. Jer Jeremiah, but can I just jump in and I want to I just want to add one point for those who are listening. And you said this, but, you know, I think a very clear example would be. You know, it doesn't have to be aid. It doesn't have to be aid no. through another organization that we're part of. It doesn't have to be a loan or anything like that. It could be something as simple as uh, an airline is now going to fly into your country instead of another. Country. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or, or you know, just mm -hmm. anything as simple as that. Shipping that line across your coast. Exactly. That It doesn't get tracked as, well, the U.S. had influence in this. But, it, it you know, there's many different ways to exert power and influence places and, and prop people up and get favors done and, you know, get access to what, whatever. We oh, absolutely. For. It's and, all, and that's all and, part of the soft power regime. Exactly. And that, so I just wanted to hammer that because in case people weren't picking up on that. Um, and then, and then I, back to the Africa point I made earlier, you know, I, I think you guys both hit it again, but you know, I think that's why we haven't, you know, put boots on the ground and been rah-rah about, you know, saving people and this and that, because it's going just fine without that. And, you know, the, it's, it's kind of like the mistakes they made in the Middle East, they're not making in Africa. They're just, you know, they're doing it outside of, of any oversight and, you know, basically even outside of the government, while the government's playing a role in it, there's a, a lot of outside entities that aren't part of our government that are playing just as much, if not more of a role in some of these things than, you know, uh, you know, play, you know, if, if it was just an American thing with American aid and American troops and American weapons. Yeah. And, and like that, that's the other half of it. It's like, it doesn't have to be, see uh, to me, I wouldn't even say that they're not the government. I would say that they're all a part of the state. And like the, the state includes the banks, the mega corporations, the NGOs, the PMCs, the boots on the ground that aren't boots on the ground, according to Congress, the things that can act with like sort of the interests of the Western or otherwise powers at heart, um, rather than like, you know, uh, the the peoples who they control. Like if if we say, for instance, that only strictly government entities qualify, we can't qualify something like the IMF, which I think is a mistake, or many members of the Bilderberg group, uh, many members of the World Economic Forum, many more members of uh, like sort of banks, and also like, like the PMCs, like XE, which was Blackwater and Academy. You know, we can't start to qualify those. And to me, I say they're all part of the state and that because they're all connected to the state and use state power and funds, that when it comes down to it, it's all members of the state at question. And like to me, yeah. as part of that, like I think that the soft power is always backed by hard power. It's like, well, you know, you could you could play ball or you could get hit with the bat. You know, like it's 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 that kind of thing on a routine <laughs> basis. And it's that with well, so many other things like that's the reason we're talking about corporations today in terms of censorship and bills, because like these corporations are considered just as much of a threat as the actual governments. And in terms of like, you know, saying that, well, TikTok is directly affiliated with the Chinese government. Sure. Facebook was partly funded by the CIA and Peter Thiel, the steering committee guy on the Bilderberg group, um, 
and the InQtel CIA venture capital firm. Um, so they're part of the U.S. government, too, through those two agencies, by the same token as t TikTok is a part of the Chinese government. So, like, if we're talking about outsized influence and considering corporations part of the state when it comes to TikTok, uh, sure, and then also Facebook applies, and then also so do all of the other, like, sort of third parties that enable the soft power state in terms of global hegemony. And then we have this 30-minute thing where, like, basically I'm not talking at all, and there was this uh, conservative near the end who was pretty concerned about trans people and the border and shit. So, yeah, I had some things to say about what he said as well. Um, and uh, I had to speed it along because I have a family call with my uh, father and sister every Thursday at around that time. So um, I took care of that. I had to speed along sort of my responses here. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think I think this one went relatively well, like as well as it could be with your local <laughs> insane, unhinged, unmedicated, bipolar, conspiracy theorist, anarchist, radical, lefty fuck um, in the conservative space. So yeah, with all that being said, um, yeah, this is the last contribution I have to this. And just imagine me rapping by saying, smash the fucking state. Hey, r real um, quick, because um, I got a book party. real soon. So let Go me just say, me. like, uh, to sort of, like, I, I don't know, provide bolstering in some ways and also a critique in others to what Cash you're saying, um, here's my thing. The border, you know, the culture war, the all of this... Typically, what those issues boil down to is the same sort of boogeyman stuff I was talking about earlier. Um, like, without the U.S. consistently destabilizing other countries, without the U.S. consistently playing regime change and loan officer and um, mega corporate and bank ally in these other places, and without them constantly, like, <clears throat> putting in place dictators who, like, let's just say, benefit state capitalism. Um, and that is contrasting to anarcho-capitalism and a libertarian capitalism <clears throat> with, like, a small government, right? Like, if, if these people would stop interfering in all these places, they would have a whole lot, a lot less money to print to begin with. They would have less inflation, less laws here at home, less things like the Patriot Act, um, less things like this FISA surveillance, less things like the censorship to justify. They create foreign boogeymen. They create people that they can use as justifications for attacking foreign nations. And the border is one of the foreign nations that they attack. Um, like, I mean, in terms of, like, the, bo the border is what they use to attack them. Like, when the, when the border is at question, what we're basically saying is we are going to deal with the problems as they come back to us rather than stopping creating them to begin with and dealing with them over there. Uh, what, we're, what we're talking about is like all these migrants who normally come from countries that the U.S. has either interfered in a foreign country or uh, the f like, you know, done some sort of regime change, done some sort of loan process with part of their hegemonic arms, their mega corporate allies, something, um, or one of their like like uh, allied nations and NATO and uh, other sorts of like facets, the Trilateral Commission, anything affiliated with the Bilderberg Group or the World Economic Forum. Like when you're dealing with these people, you're dealing with people who have created a global system of oppression that gradually destroys any nation that doesn't fall in line until it's willing to and then exploits them. That's the reason a bunch of countries are de-dollarizing right now, um, including like Zimbabwe of all things and getting back on like gold back currencies because they recognize the threat to foreign influence in their own countries and they want to stop being expropriated. Um, but the countries that have seen the most migration from them and the countries typically listed and the reason people like, you know, the Biden administration and Trump can fearmonger about like terrorists is uh, they're, they're the countries that have been most interfered with by American interests. And I just want to bring that up because if we stopped being 
a country of foreign entanglements, if we followed basically the libertarian platform in that way, um, and if we started to be more mindful of like the global influence of the hegemony that benefits us on a daily basis, um, a lot of these problems would get solved before they even hit the border, and we would have a whole lot less use for things like throwing families and razor wire at the water, and we would have a whole lot less use for a militarized border or a constitution-free zone that absorbs two-thirds of the American population. The real truth is what Ron Paul said, which is that like anything that can be used to keep them out can be used to keep you in. And when it comes down to it, that's what they've been doing. They've been slowly building a cage around the entire planet, and most notably and specifically and isolatedly, uh, American citizens. And using f the threat of foreign whatever or sympathizers to foreign whatever as an excuse. That's the reason Tr Trump had the whole Russiagate thing happen to him despite no proof, because they've always been able to point at Russia or communism or China or the Reds or whatever in order to say that people here should be surveilled, people here should be targeted, people here should be under like under scrutiny by the government. So what I what I mean to say and like I got a book soon, that's the reason I'm trying to fire all this shit at you. I apologize if this is just a barrage, but at the same time I'm also bipolar and insane. So, like, when I'm talking about this stuff, what all I'm saying is, like, we need to be wary anytime anything involving foreign influences comes up, because a house divided against itself cannot stand. A house built on the sand will fall, and they're trying to divide us so that we're conquered, divide us against the people that we could be united with around the world, so that we cannot form a global network against this globalist state. So if you really want to form that, I really strongly urge you to consider these problems as something that we could solve by lack of involvement rather than more power. And that's, you know, that's what I was saying about the author authoritarian stuff is, you know, that's what I'm trying to educate on. And I just did, I just spammed our comments with four different things. And let me just, I just wanted to say something to Jeremiah uh, before we go lizard and then Casey. Um, but you know, that's why, Jeremiah, I urge you not to give up on MAGA. And I think the difference between me and, you know, some of the anarchists is I think a lot of anarchists think we can flip a switch and, you know, get rid of the federal government. And I think there's an in-between stage, mostly because there's no chance they're ever going to flip the switch and there's not going to be a government. It would be, you know, whether it would work or not, it's a whole different story. But, well, you know, they're taking more power. They're not going to give up power. At some but, point, we should have a debate about that because I got a whole bunch to say about that, especially since MAGA targeted me and my people, and I talked about that earlier. But uh, either way... Well, I, I, would, I, would, I would love to do that. But, but what I did, you know, again, I'm on the education side, and, you know, please check out my stuff. I have stuff under highlights that's some pretty good stuff. Um, but... I, what I did is, and I thought this was clever, is I, I used Grok and I went to Grok and I said, what are the top 10 things most important to uh, MAGA people? And and I got a, a pretty good list. And I think you'd actually be, you know, fairly happy with the list. It's still, you know, federal government and all of that stuff, but it's not, you know, right wing, crazy well, you know, nutty stuff. At some it's point, straightforward stuff. At some point, we and, can have a debate on that. But right now, I got a book. I got a family call coming up. Sounds good. No, so thanks for joining. Appreciate it. Uh, as always, you added a lot. So appreciate it. 